Jeremiah was talking to a community of people that were in the midst of a really difficult place in life. Things weren't going well, well for their country. And amidst all the challenges and all the struggles and all the certainties, Jeremiah the prophet says, and this is in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. He says to the people, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. I wonder, who couldn't use a little bit of that today? Rest for your souls. Actually, I want you, wherever you are right now, sitting on the couch, maybe you're in a room all by yourself, I don't care, maybe you're with, raise your hand, right? If you can say right now, I could use a little rest for my soul, raise your hand, right? Let your body talk to your mind, because sometimes we need to like connect things connect the pieces. Do you need some rest for your souls? Who doesn't? We're at the crossroads of a generation. There's so many things that we're facing and, and so many uncertainties with the pandemic and, and how long it's going to last and how long it's going to take for the vaccines to roll out and, and when am I going to get mine and, and what are the implications going to be for the economy and, and we're um, facing what for us and kind of the pride of our democracy is the peaceful transition of power. And now we're heading into a week where we're at that transition point. We're standing at the crossroads. Will it be peaceful this time? There's all kinds of concern and, and confusion and, and chaos and frustration and anger on, on all sides of the political aisle. We stand at the crossroads. And it's exhausting, right? It's exhausting for our minds. It's exhausting for our bodies. It's, it's exhausting for our souls. Jeremiah said, stand at the crossroads and look. We are in the third week of a series based on our drawing from a book that Andy Stanley wrote called The Principle of the Path. And uh, I um, use that, uh, Andy Stanley's teachings, without regret because his teacher is actually King Solomon, which comes from the scriptures. And so we're looking at this, um, the principle of the path and, and how it is that we get to where we want to go in life and how it is that we ended up where we are in life. And, and there, are some, there are notes that go along with this message this morning. You can uh, find those on our website. There'll probably be a link. There should be a link in your Facebook feed that you can access them there. Um, to, to help you kind of follow through the message. And, and I hope also that you can use it through the week to continue to think about and reflect upon on the message. Because, you know, I spend um, time every week preparing these. And if I don't write things down and if I don't reflect on it, I honestly, I can walk out of church and forget what I said. I actually have forgotten out of church, walked out of church and forgotten what the preacher said, even when I'm the preacher. So, so use that as a resource for you this week. The principle of the path is that destinations lie at the end of paths. Or, or said another, that direction determines destination. That, that if you want to end up at the right destination, that you have to take the right path. And if you sit right now and you say, where am I, that you can actually say, well, how is it that, got, that, that I got to where I am? And that you can look back and see that there was a path that you took that led you to where you are. It's a really simple. It's a really simple principle, right? If you get on the 5 South to go to San Francisco, you will not get there. You, you, you won't. I don't care how badly you want to go to San Francisco, how deep your desire, for, how deeply motivated or intent you upon. If you get on the 5 South, you will go to Mexico. If you want to go to San Francisco, you have to get on the 5 North. And you might run into to a traffic jam. You might run into a roadblock. You might have to take some detours. But you will get there eventually. You will never get to San Francisco on 5 South. Direction determines destination is a path we're on or taking us to the place that we're going. Jeremiah gives us a formula 
for getting on the right path. He says four things. He says, stand. Stand, which is to say, if you're moving right now, stop moving. Stand where you are. Now, a lot of this has been stopped in our tracks so that the, the uh, injunction or the imperative to, to stand might feel like, well, of course I'm standing. I can't go anywhere. I'm stuck in my house. But we can still be going 100 miles an hour not moving anywhere. Stand in your, in your anxiousness, in your worry, in your stop. Stop where you are. And then he says, and look. Look around. Last week we looked at um, the Solomon's teaching from Proverbs chapter 27, verse 12. He says, the prudent see danger. Like they're looking around. They see the road ahead. And if they see danger ahead, they're looking around. Take refuge. But you got to stop and look. And, and then he has a third piece of uh, counsel here. Now that you've stopped and you're looking around, ask. And when it comes to directions, many of us have a very difficult time with this part of it, especially those of us who are in the male species. Ask. Ask for directions. Ask for the way to the ancient paths. Ask for the good way. And then he says, and after you've stopped and you've looked and you've asked and you get your answer, then he says, and now you've got to do one more thing. He says, now you need to walk in it. In the path that you're given, in the way that you're, now you have to move. You have to do something. You have to act on it. The trailhead to the good way both in my own experience, in my observation and participation in the lives of other people, isn't always easy to find. The good way is not, the trailhead is, isn't always easy to find. Most people, I think, probably all people, want to be happy. We can debate about what makes us happy or, or where we'll find happiness or, or how we can achieve happiness. There's, there's lots of different ways that we can kind of walk around that and talk about happiness, but most of us want to be happy. I, do, I mean, I don't know that I've ever met anybody who says, you know, I really want my life to be an industrial strength vacuum cleaner. Right? Even if you say happiness is not the goal, we don't want our life to be the opposite, right? But what makes me happy today will often make me decidedly unhappy tomorrow. Right? What makes me happy today? If I just to say, if I wake up in the morning and say, hey, you know what? I want to be happy. What, what will make me happy today? My good friend Ron gave me um, a, a jar of M&M's, peanut M&M's for, for Christmas, uh, one of my favorites. And it's like, I don't know, three pounds worth. It would make me exceedingly happy to eat all three pounds at once. Now, the good news is I have tremendous, I still actually have some left. We're like, I don't know, three weeks from after Christmas, right? No, <laughs> thank you, thank you for it, right? Happy today does not always equal happy tomorrow, right? It may make you very, very happy to walk into work tomorrow and, and tell your boss to, to take this job and shove it. But that may not be such a good thing in a week or two. We're spending hours upon hours, many of us, on social media every day. And, and every time we hit a, hit a like or, or get a like, we get a hit of dopamine. And that dopamine gives us a, a sense of happiness. And, and so we, we keep going back to it over and over and over and over again. And, and what we're finding from all kinds of research is that all the time that we're spending investing in social media and those connections and those, and that do, those hits of dopamine that are making us happy in the moment are making us exceedingly unhappy over time. Your Amazon shopping spree this afternoon may make you happy today. And then when the debt collectors start calling and saying, we want your money, we want you to pay up, you owe us, 
unhappy. And, and the challenge is this, that choices are now, right? I make a choice about what I want to do today. I make that choice now, but the outcomes are later. And the choices that we're making because they're now are evident. I know if I eat these M&Ms that they're going to taste really good and they're going to like tickle my taste buds and it's going to be really, really sweet. But the outcome is going to come in an hour later or two hours or three hours down the road. Oh, golly, I feel terrible. Right? The choices that we're making now are, are, that are evident. But the outcomes come down the road. And we continue to, ruse, to choose the wrong path because we're looking at to do, today. We know what we want today, but we don't always know where that will take us tomorrow. And then complicating matters add to the equation that once we've decided what it is that we want, what it is that's going to make us happy, and once we've clarified that in our mind, then we actually tell our brain to support our decision. And our brain literally will start to, will start to filter out all the information that, that contests or protests or goes against our decision, and our brain will start to filter in all the information that supports our decision. And so we start, stop hearing things that we need to hear and keep hearing things that are feeding that direction. Happy today doesn't always equal happy tomorrow. And, and the counterintuitive reality is this, that hard choices today, the difficult decisions that we make today, more often equal happiness in the future. Now, not every hard choice, right? We can make some really, really dumb hard choices too, but if we make a hard choice that is a good choice, but it's a difficult choice, we use delayed gratification as opposed to instant gratification, that delaying gratification, making hard choices today, more often, most often, equals, leads to happiness tomorrow. I, I've never met a person who regretted saving money. I, I haven't met a person who, regret, who regretted giving money. But I've met all kinds of people and have had my own days where I have great regret about spending money. Spending is easy. Saving is harder. Giving can be even harder yet. I've never met anyone who regretted a fling that they didn't have. I know a few people who deeply regret the flings that they did have. I don't know anyone who's regretted the education that they got. But I know a few people that regret the opportunities that they squandered. And our problem is rarely a lack of information or insight. It's rarely that we don't know what the right choice is, or that we don't recognize that this is an easy choice, that our easy choice is going to have a uh, difficult... It's rarely a lack of information. It's not that we don't know. Because, I, I mean, how many times do we say to ourselves, oh man, I, I should have seen this coming. The, the handwriting was all over the wall. It was right there for me to see. Because it was right there for us to see. The problem isn't typically a lack of information or insight. It's more often a lack of honesty, a lack of honesty about what it is that we really do want or why it is that we want it, what our motives are. And we will never get to where we want to be until we're honest about where we are. We will never get to where we want to be because we're only going to get where we're going by starting where we are, and if we're not honest about wh where we are, we don't know how to chart the path to where it is that we're going. 
And so that's why Jeremiah's counsel becomes so essential to us. Stop. Stop where you are. Lift up your head. Look around. Ask. When we come clean with ourselves about the truth beyond, behind the choices that we have made and the truth about where we are, we are honest with ourselves. We are on the verge then of finding freedom. Look. Stop. Look. Ask. And then walk. Solomon gives us direction in finding the way forward. Yeah, like this, if you have a street sign, the, the message is good way, right? This is good way avenue. It's from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And there's two parts to the statement here, right? He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Okay, trust in God. And then the, the second half of it is, and in addition to trusting in God, do not lean on, do not rely upon, do not trust your own understanding of things. Right? You, you can actually flip it around if it's, if it's like, okay, what does that really mean? You could say this, lean on God, lean into God, trusting it, lean on God, and do not trust your own understanding. As you're navigating your path, don't lean on your grasp of reality, on your understanding of how things worked, of your experiences from the past. Don't rely upon what your good buddy who you trust tells you. Don't rely upon, oh wow, you know what, I saw this movie one time, and what Matt Damon did was, and if I just did that, maybe then, do not, he says, do not rely on your own understanding. Don't prop yourself up with your own genius. He says, lean into God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. The answers to life aren't about getting the right information, Solomon says. It's not about getting the right insight to help us find our way. Solomon says, here it is. You want to know what the key to your path forward is. He says, it's not about what you know. It is about who you know. It's not about what you trust. It is about who you trust. It's not about your past experiences. It's about the path that God is leading you on into your future. Trust in the Lord. Lean on God. Rely upon him. Not your own understanding. Put all of your confidence, all of your hope in God. He says, in all your ways, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Know him. Lean on him. So what I want you to do, you can start this morning, you can start right now, but, but through this week too. I want you to do this. Make a list of all the paths that you're on. If you're, if you're married, you're on, you're on the path of, of the covenant of marriage. If you have kids, you're on the path of parenting. If you run a business or own a business, you're on the path of being a business leader. If you are an employee of a business, you're on the path of employment. If you live in a community, in a neighborhood, you're on the path of relationships with your neighbors. What are all the paths that you're on? If you're on the path of faith, list all the paths that you're traveling on. The path of your finances. The path of your education. 
the path of your health. Make of all the, la- the, the paths that you're on. And then with that list, just make, a, make three columns, right? Make a list of your paths. And in the, in the second column, ask the question, how am I trying to make my way on this path? How am I trying to make it work? What am I doing in my marriage? What am I doing in my parenting? How am I doing with my finances? How am I doing with my health? Look at the paths that you're on and then make a second call and say, hey, what am I doing? How am I working on this path? And then a more important question, and how's it going? Right? Is, is my marriage flourishing? Are, are my finances stable and, and giving me a sense of, uh, of security and... and um, in, in my household, is, is, my, is my health good? Am I, am I living the li- kind of life today that will help me do the things that I want to do tomorrow? How, how's my parenting going? How is, on the paths that I'm traveling, how am I doing on those paths? And then the, the final qu- column is this. What would I do differently if I were leaning on God more fully? What would I do differently if I were trusting God more than my own understanding, if I were trusting God more than my own experiences, if I were trusting God more even than common sense? What would I be doing differently if I were leaning on God in on this path? And and then toward that, well, how do we know what it is that God has for us on those paths? How how do we walk in that? What is it that is God's path? We have God's word. We have the scripture that tells us the stories of generations of people who who have walked with, with God that have gone before us and how they walked with God on their paths. And what we see oftentimes in those paths is, is that it's, as I said before, the, the details about what to do in any given, given situation are often far different than what we might expect. Far different than we might anticipate. Even different, like in one, I can get an example. God um, instructed David in, in a battle. And he said, okay, we're going to go fight this battle this way. And, and, and David went up and he fought the battle. And then later on in the scripture, David is facing the exact same enemy, the exact same battlefield. And David could have concluded, well, you know what? The last time we were here, this is the way we did it. But he goes to God and he says, hey, God, what are we going to do this time? And God gives him a completely different battle plan. It's, it's always about the relationship, not necessarily the principles, but we see in those scriptures. We learn how to walk with God by looking at how those who have gone before us walked with God. And God does speak truth into how the world works in his scriptures. And he's spoken pretty definitively on a wide array of issues that we face in our lives. Many of them contradict popular opinion and conventional wisdom. Jesus says, the world says, if you want to be great, then go out and lord your power and your authority and rule over people. He says, I'm building a different kind of kingdom. So if you want to be great in my kingdom, don't lord it over people. Become a servant. Become the lead servant. Become the greatest of servants and you will become great. He gives us specific directions on how to handle things like money. Give to God what is God's. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where, earth and mo- where rust and moth destroy. Store up for yourself treasures in heaven. He gives us direction on marriage. Do not, he says, do not be unequally yoked. 
Right? It, and, but we're in love. But I can change him. Don't join, don't start down a path with someone who is going to pull you in a completely different direction that's going to take you away from God. Do not, right? What does God's word say about the direction that we're traveling that inform how we might lean in to trust him on that path? We have God's word. We have God's spirit. God's spirit is useful on multiple levels, right? We can rely upon the, the spirit to in that, in that process of discernment, right? This is the path I'm on. How is it going? The spirit informs us, guides us in, in testing the fruit. Yeah, if, I'm, if I'm walking down this relational path and, and what it's creating in my life is heartache and anger and frustration and disappointment and pain, confusion, then that's not the fruit of the Spirit, right? That's not the way of the Spirit because we know that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We can call upon the Spirit to help us assess where we are and how it's going. We can call upon the Spirit to guide us. John chapter 16, Jesus says, the Spirit of the truth, Spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. The Spirit doesn't even speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. The Spirit guides us on the path that God actually dwells in us, leads us on this path. And the Spirit then also infuses us with the, the power that we need to walk in that path. We have God's Word. We have God's Spirit. We have God's design. It's what we've been talking about. Direction determines destination. There is a way that God has designed the world to work. That if we treat our bodies a certain way, they will respond in a certain way. If we handle our money in a certain way, that the outcome will function in a certain way. Proverbs chapter 19, Solomon says, A person's own folly ruins their life, yet their heart rages against the Lord. Their own foolishness is what takes us down one path, and then we end up yelling at God, screaming at God, crying out to God, how did I get here? Well, you walk down that path. Are we walking and living by God's design for our lives, for the world? Will what I'm doing naturally lead to the outcome that I want? And then he says... It says, when you trust the Lord with all your heart and, and lean not on your own wisdom, your own understanding, your own experience, and we, in, in all of your ways, you acknowledge God. He says, and then he will make your paths straight. When you do this, then the outcome will be this. You will have a straight path. When I was a sophomore in high school, I took geometry. And one of the things you learn in geometry, you probably learned it earlier in life, but this is the time that I remember learning it, that the shortest distance between two points is what? It's a straight line. The shortest distance between, now this is not rocket science, I understand, but I was sharing my newfound wisdom with my grandpa, and my grandpa was a pilot. And my grandpa was, you know, bringing his wisdom and says, you know what, that's actually not true. The shortest distance between two points is not always a straight line. Because when you're flying a long distance, because of the curvature of the world, right, because it's round, that you can actually have a shorter distance flying from one place to the other by flying in an arc. Which is why when you fly from one place to the other, the plane, the flight always goes like this or like this, right? It's always in an arc. It's never a straight line. 
To which I wisely said, that does not change the fact that the shortest distance between two points is, is the straight line. It still is a straight line. You would just have to drill through the earth to get from one point to the other point, but the shortest distance is still, in fact, a straight line. Straight doesn't mean quickest. It doesn't mean it's going to be the quickest way to get there. Straight doesn't mean it's the easiest way to get there. Straight means it is the shortest distance to the place that God purposes to take us in our lives. It is the most direct, not the easiest, not the quickest, but the good way. And so this is... I say this often, but, it, but it's really true, right? These are words. And words are so easily forgotten. I encourage you to take these words, to sit with them, to pray over them, to walk through a process this week that will help you look at where you've been, that's gotten you to where you are, and how it's going, and allow God to speak into your life and as you look to, how am I going to move forward in these important areas of my life? And maybe don't try and do the same thing all at once. Maybe it's just, I'm, this, you know, for right now, I need to focus. This is the most important area of my life that's off the rails. It's not going the way that I want to go. I'm going to lean into God and, and seek his understanding for this and walk in that path. Well, I pray for this discernment that we need in each of our lives to make an honest assessment of where we are. To be honest about how it is that we got to where we are when we're not where we want to be. And that honesty would also to lead us to a posture of humility, of stopping, of looking, of asking, of your word and your spirit to guide us, and then to give us the courage to make hard choices today that will lead to preferable outcomes in the future, that bring blessing, stability, security, foundation to our lives, to our relationships, to our community, to our world. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.